Hello, Instagram. Hello, YouTube. Welcome to day 34 of OT with DA and NTR. Greetings, everybody. Sounds a little bit like NPR. Yeah, a little bit. NTR. All right. Um, we hope you are all having a wonderful day, a wonderful Sabbath. If you're a Sabbath keeper, wherever you are on God's green earth, uh, where we are at here in Colorado, it is uh, Friday evening and the Sabbath has begun. We just had a wonderful meal made by my wife. And we also had- That a, was good food. By good way. food. Yeah, really she's good. Violet is a, a good great cook. cook. She's a great cook. She's a great cook. What are you fiddling with? I'm just trying to- Are you trying to get yourself in there? Just trying, yeah, I'm just trying to- Nathan, agree. I'm really glad we have that backlight there so that it lights up your hair. Yeah, I love the hair light. Isn't yeah, it Yeah, the hair light. Because see, look, on in my hair, you get that. And then I- No, I, I've got the halo. Yeah. Oh, it's the halo effect. It's a halo. It's a halo. Uh, we hope you had an awesome day today. We had a great day. Oh. We went rock climbing. It was phenomenal. What did you do today? Let us know here on uh, Instagram Live what you did today. Happy Sabbath. A lot of happy Sabbaths. Feliz Sabado. Hello from Northwest Ohio. Nice. Love Megan. Help. She's actually, it's tomorrow for her. She's, oh, she's, she's in, in Australia. Australia. Okay, what did you do today? Let us know what you did. A lot of happy Sabbaths still coming through. Preparation day here. Did anybody else go rock climbing? Let's see. What did you guys have for dinner? Oh, we have this really we have this really great potatoes and peas dish that my wife makes with a cabbage salad and Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts. So somebody says I cooked. Okay, wait, wait, I missed a few. Okay, happy Sabbath. Shoveled Pre snow. Prepared for Sabbath. Uh, worked, worked and got groceries. Happy Sabbath from North Carolina. Got checked for strep. Oh, super fun. That sounds great. Yeah. Gabby Abby says I worked. Um, hello from Wisconsin. Hi from Michigan. Happy Sabbath to you guys. Hey, Jim, what'd you do today? That's what we're asking. This guy Get with the program. Fertilize the oh, pasture. Oh, fertilized your pasture. That's Cleaned. cool. Oh, another one from Petoskey, Petoskey Michigan. Michigan. Baked artisan bread. Sweet. Oh, that's awesome. Went to the dentist. Yikes. I'm sorry to hear that. Financial paperwork, Cassandra. I know you're jealous. Uh -huh. Yeah. Not, not, not rock climbing. Not rock climbing. Okay. Kelly worked. Hey, hey. there's Becky Renner. Hey, guys. Ha, huh, that's your wife tuning that's in. Right. Um, woke up. <laughs> Naomi says she woke up. Okay, oh. I get you because it's it's early there. Um, let's see. Brendan says worked. Um, Terry's hey, been look praying. At there. There's Christian. Christian O'Day, we love you. Uh, <laughs> I saw what you said, and I'm not going to quote it out loud, mate. Um, payroll, Rock of Ages, taxes, oh, fun. worked. Honeydews. Honeydews. There oh, I know what those are. Honey do this and honey do yeah, that. Yeah, honey yeah. do this and honey do that's good. Picked up a package from Jamaica. Whoa, what was in that package from Jamaica? All right, welcome everybody. <laughs> we had an awesome day today. We went rock climbing. We got up early, had a wonderful morning, did our reading, and I actually read the chapter to Nathan out loud, because that's the kind of guy I am, wow. on the way to the rock climbing cliff, which is about a 50 minute drive from my house. And it was kind of cool because in the story, oh, yeah, tell that, tell that. there is this sort of journey through the mountains and the craggy places. And we were thinking, hey, we're like driving to the mountains, yeah. to the craggy places. Yeah. So there's pretty the, cool. So there's that little paragraph there where it's quite nostalgic. Yeah. I actually wrote nostalgia in the margin. And as we were reading that, we looked up and here was this like, it was, it was Beautiful awesome. Beautiful mountains. Beautiful. Craggy places. Um, so we climbed today. Nathan climbed extremely well, which was... He's a very strong climber. I climbed well, which was great. And then on the way back, we picked up a hitchhiker. He was a very <laughs> interesting guy. He, Tell us about the hitchhiker, Nathan. He has done 20,000 exorcisms. Yep. He has Only 20,000 exorcisms. 20,000 exorcisms. He has um, hit, he's been picked up by more than 1 million people while uh, hitchhiking. hitchhiking. Um, he... He, he has a ministry. What's his ministry? His ministry is he hitchhikes and then people pick him up and then he works miracles. That's it. And then when we dropped him off, we drove with him for probably half an hour, yeah. 20 minutes. He, just as we were getting ready to drop him off, he said, hey, do you guys need a miracle in your life? And I actually do need some miracles in my life. But I was afraid to say that I needed anything because I was afraid that if he prayed for me, <laughs> a bad spirit might be you, present. You might get the opposite of a miracle. Yeah. He, was a, he was an interesting guy. He was very, very nice. Very sweet. Very sweet. Very nice. And uh, I, I think, I could be wrong about this, but I think his ministry might be, in part, to get in the car with people. This is what he does. He hitchhikes. That's his ministry. Yeah. And then to like cast demons out of people. That's right. That's exactly what he said he does. 
So, Although I think he also is always happy to receive a little love offering at the end of the did ride. Did you notice? Right at the end. Yeah. Right at the end. We're like in the middle of this busy street dropping him off. And at the very, very, very end, he's like opening the door. He's on, he's getting out. And he's like, hey, you guys wouldn't happen to have a few bucks, would you? And I never have cash on me. Yeah, I don't. You could either. stop me 100 times in a year, just at random times. And I would have cash on me one time. Yeah, yeah. How many times would you have cash? Uh, about the same. We, you know what we need? We need a QR code on the screen during our church services so that right, people exactly. can just like beep, beep, and right. it can pop something. I mean, I have, I have an, well, okay, that's not true because Violetta has cash. But me personally, David Ashford, uh -huh. I have not put my own money in an offering thing, you know, that they pass by in church service for years. Yeah, yeah. I, I get, just, I just. I get paid. I go to AdventistGiving.com. I, exactly. I just, I just do it electronically. Yeah. I, I like the idea of doing it. And uh, my wife does it, but I just, I never have cash. But this person, what's cash? <laughs> white shirt. White shirt. Yeah, I, this is kind of a white shirt. Apologies. I, I hope you don't mind it. I think it's quite a nice shirt. It was given to me by my nephew because it's a size medium and he has giant muscles. I know this will be hard to believe, but even bigger than mine. <laughs> and uh, the shirt was too tight for him. So I said, well, I'll wear it. And he gave it to me. And I'm into free shirts. Uh, free shirts are better than ones that you pay for. Um, we love you all. We're going to get started. And oh, by the way, this is the book I was recommending. That's the book you want to get. In Granite or Ingrained by Skip McCarty. Take a screenshot of that. Screenshot that Instagram. Okay, you got it? That's the book you want. And for oh, those of you on YouTube. He did wear a white shirt and a tie. Oh, wow. While, while oh. hitchhiking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was he wearing? He was, he in the was back wearing seat. a tie. Was he really? Yeah. Yeah, he wore a white shirt and a tie. And he, he asked us at the end if we needed a miracle. But I was a little nervous about his miracles. Anyway, that's the book you want. In Granite or Ingrained. Skip yeah. McCarty. What the Old and New Covenants Reveal About the Gospel, the Law, and the Sabbath. That's what we talked about yesterday. Nathan, today we're talking about from Sinai to Kadesh. Kadesh. Today is day 34. I normally say that right at the outset. So today is day 34 of OT with DA. We're in chapter 33, and uh, kind of an interesting chapter. Yeah, not an easy one. You know, when I first listened to it, I thought to myself- When I was reading it- You know- To you, because I'm nice. It's gonna be tough. But then when I reread it, and just was underlining, I was like, oh, there's actually a lot of Look gems in here. Look at this, it says, had to be Peter. It had to be Peter. That person literally knows the name yeah. of the person that picked us up. That's exactly who it is. I oh, you know who this is? This is Barbara from, um, she lives up in Copper. Isn't that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's who it was. Is that is that Barbara? Up in yeah, Copper? It could be. That's that's. It was Peter. Wild. It was Peter. I cannot believe that you know who it was. How do you know that? We need to find that out. Yeah, his name was Peter. He's Wild. A, he's, he's the author of a book, and uh, it's been uh, and translated and in seven a, languages. Uh, he has a website. He has I, don't a think, website. I don't think we should. Probably tell not going to tell you the name of the website. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, God bless you all, Nathan. I'm going to start with prayer. You remember to close chapter thirty three. From Sinai to Kadesh, I'm fired up. You fired up? Fired up. Okay, let's go. Father in heaven, we've had an amazing day. And Lord, really, truthfully, every day with Jesus, even if it wasn't a great day externally, it's a great day. It's a day to be alive. It's a day to know you. It's a day to live in the light of your love. And Father, we say with the Apostle Paul, even if the outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. Mm. And so we feel super blessed to know you, to understand you, well enough to be able to teach others and to learn from others. And Lord, as we go back now into the Old Testament and in this particular chapter, uh, begin the post-Sinai journeys with Israel uh, into the future, uh, toward the promised land. Lord, they're anticipating it's going to be quite a short journey. They have no idea what's coming. But Lord, we do know what's coming. And as we begin this journey with them away from Sinai toward the promised land, what are the lessons for us? What are the opportunities for us to learn? And uh, be with us now as we open the chapter. May you open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so this is based on Numbers chapters 11 and 12. We're not going to read that. But um, you know what I did do, Nathan? And I sometimes do this, and I'll just quickly recite. If it's helpful to me just to mark down what's covered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like sometimes it's just a single thing, and it's really easy. It's about one thing. Yeah. But then other times when you got these narratives, she just takes quite a little bit of material and puts it all together. So here's right. here's what this covers. As I sort of wrote it down. Here, outline the chapter. Outline the chapter. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight things. Okay, so first of all, she opens with like orderliness in the camp. Mm -hmm. 
Then they leave Sinai. And then you have the emergence of this dissatisfaction, this discontent. There's murmuring, which is kind of the same thing. Then God sends the quail. Mm -hmm. And then Moses falters, which I'm actually, that's the thing I'm probably looking forward to talking about the most. Then the whole Miriam and Aaron jealousy thing. Mm -hmm. And then she closes talking about how the 70 were going to help basically Moses bear his burdens. That's yeah. kind of the outline of yeah. the chapter. You, you cool with that? Yep. Um, okay, so I'm on page 450, 450 of the types and symbols. That's 374 of the original. And um, 450, 451, Nathan, the first few pages here talk about the sort of arrangement of the camp, the orderliness of the camp, yeah, yeah, the cleanliness yeah. of the camp. I, I'll tell you what, what jumped, jumped out, out at me. Yeah, yeah. What jumped out at me is second paragraph, the governor, government of Israel was characterized by the most thorough organization, wonderful alike for its completeness and its simplicity. Okay. So, I mean, I immediately thought, wow, when I think about how a church should be organized, mm. the organization should be thorough and complete. And simple. But it needs to be simple. Okay. And, uh, you know, one of the things that I've, I've thought so much about when it comes to way churches work, there's like basically four kinds of churches. There's, there's, oh, there's, I'm excited about this. There's, Go. there's churches that are kind of, they're all about following Jesus. Yep. And, and that's my, kind you know, of church. it's all about moving toward Jesus, but there is no discipline or intentionality okay. in helping facilitate that for, that for people. We call, I call that the hippie church. Okay. Okay. By the way, I didn't come up with this language. I borrowed it from a, a book called No Silver Bullets. I thought it was quite a powerful book. That's a hippie church. And then okay, so they got the hippie church. They love Jesus, but there's not a lot of sort of structure. Right. But it's not the church isn't organized. Like, you know, it's like, how do you how do you become a disciple of Jesus at this church? It's like, well, hopefully you'll get into some group and you know, oh, you'll go maybe you'll meet somebody. Maybe you'll, yeah, but there's okay. no intentionality. It's not a well defined path. And then you have other churches there. Is this the second type? Yeah, we'll call it the second type. And it's kind of the church where it's like they're always chasing the next thing. And you, you call that kind of the copycat church. They hear about one church is doing this and they're like, hey, let's do this. Right. And they try it a minute and then give up. Right. Or there's or there's the silver bullet church. They're like dreaming of the next big thing to come. Yeah, what's the new innovation? Yeah. And 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 that's gonna fix the church. And then and then there's what what's called the intentional church where they, they know that discipleship is all about pursuing Jesus. And they also know that the church has a responsibility to organize itself mm. so that it can facilitate that in the lives of the people. So you have a well-defined path from coming into the church, A to B, B to C, C to D, and you're on your pathway to discipleship. That's right. That's right. And I think basically- did you, What church did you call that? Intentional? An intentional church, yeah, right? Like it's discipleship is about following Jesus and we take our responsibility as leaders very seriously. And we're saying, how can we facilitate that process of leading people in to walk closely with Jesus? Moving the congregation that's along. Exactly well, that's right. actually really good because that's an, a very good analogy for what's happening here. Like they're well organized. Yep. They're scru scrupulously clean. They've got their banners, their flags. They've got yep, their yep. organization, the Levites. And, and remember the, the sort of sons there, the Kohathites, the Merorites, and the Ger Gershonites. And she, they all have their job. That's right. And she begins with Moses' job. And I think this is so yeah. incredibly powerful. She In the last sentence on page 450, um, that second paragraph, she says, Moses, 374 of the original. Moses stood as their visible leader by God's appointment yep. to administer the laws in his name. And I thought, this is so powerful. Moses' job wasn't to write laws. Mm. Moses' job wasn't to make decisions and invent things. Moses' job was to administer what God had put in place. And I think, you know... He's as, an administrator. As, as a gospel ministers, our authority is not that we are ministers of the gospel. Our authority is only... It only exists insofar as we point people to the Word of God. Yeah, that you're like administrating on behalf of, of God's will. That's right, and that's revealed in his word. Well, well, it's so interesting that you would say this because one of the things that's going to happen later in the chapter when Moses falters is he's going to he's going to make a mistake and he's going to assume that he's not in administration, that he's like in upper management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. He he thinks he he and he's going to take responsibilities on himself that Ellen White says that he didn't need to. 
So there's this little falter, and I, we'll get to there in a little bit, but I, it is interesting that she says, this was the plan, but in, in my reading of this chapter, and I wonder if anybody else saw this, I think she's moving very purposefully from orderliness to sort of an increasing progressive disorderliness right. through murmuring, through uh, uh, Moses faltering, through mm -hmm, envy. Mm -hmm. uh, she's, she's showing that things start to break down very quickly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's got, got then, this sort of entropy feel. It's and falling apart. She ends with this sort of exhortation uh, because the, the 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 chaos broke out, the entropy took place yeah. because of speaking evil, right. of murmuring. And so she kind of ends with saying, like, if we want to prevent this sort of chaos from breaking out in our communities, yeah. this is what we need to do. And 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 it's kind of a tough chapter because there's some pretty violent yeah. judgments. Yeah. And there's intentionality in that when mm -hmm. you look at the whole flow of the chapter. Okay, so just a couple more things, because we'll be talking more about those violent judgments in a second. The thing that popped out to me in pages one and two, back to that same paragraph Nathan was just in, the second paragraph in the whole thing, I loved this. This is the sentence right before what you read. God was, at, God was the center of authority and government, the sovereign of Israel. So she literally goes down. She says it was God, and then it was Moses. And then it was the 70, then it was the priests, then it was the chiefs or princes, yep, yep, then yep. it was the leaders, then it was the officers. I mean, that's well-defined, it's mm -hmm, well-ordered. Mm -hmm. And it's, let's be honest, it's hierarchical, right? It starts with God and it goes right down. Not in, in terms of all of the individuals here, it's not ontologically hierarchical because mm -hmm. they're all made in the image of God. But that was the thing that jumped out to me, that God's at the center, and then go to the next paragraph, right? This is on page 451. The Hebrew camp was arranged in exact order, it was separated in three great divisions, each having its appointed position in the encampment. In the center was the tabernacle, the abiding place for the invisible king. So she's clearly making the point that, that God's tent, God's tabernacle, wasn't just in the center in some figurative sense, that God is the center of it all, Yeah, yeah. right? And there's actually a really, um, kind of a very cool way to think about the Bible. Theologians will sometimes talk about the Bible as being theocentric. And it's just the idea that the Bible is centered around God, God's word, mm -hmm. God's actions, God's will, God's covenant, God's goodness, God's mercy, right? This is a story about God interacting with human beings. Human beings are not the heroes of the story. God's the hero of the story, yeah. right? And of course, in the New Testament, Jesus, God in the flesh, is the hero of the story. And so I just like that idea, that very simple idea, put God at the center, yeah. Put God at the center. And when God is at the center, everything that radiates out from God will find its proper orientation. Yeah, man. That's beautiful. You like I that? I really appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Turning the page. You happy with that? Definitely. Okay. Next page. So then she continues to talk about the orderliness. And she says that as they would move, the Ark of the Covenant was out in front of them, which is very cool. Like mm. God is at the pointy end of the spear, mm -hmm. right? Because the you have the Ark and uh, that's, of course, where the mercy seat is and the Shekinah. And so God is leading them. Symbolically, the idea is that they're followers and God is the leader. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yep. And then she says that like all of a sudden, this kind of like murmuring starts to break out and there's problems. And, um, oh no, am, am I, I'm, maybe I'm a page ahead. a little, yeah, you're a page ahead. But I'm just seeing this, they were punished with death. And I was assuming that that was right at the bottom of that paragraph. It was the duty of the leaders. Oh, so if they, if they broke ranks. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking yeah, this is uh, when the fire comes down there at, um, what was the name of that place? We'll get to there in just a yeah, second. Yeah. Tab, Tabaroth. I was two pages burning. in. Yeah. But, the, but just the idea here that, that and I'm just going to say this up front. Some yeah. of the violent stuff that happens in this chapter, where like here, she says that, yeah, if you broke ranks, that was punishable, punish, punishable with death. And then later when there's like sort of violent skirmishes break out, yeah. she says that was punished by death. Yep, and then yep. uh, what was the other one that was punished? Oh, yeah, when they eat the quail. And I'm going to drop this little bomb on you right here. Look at page 453, right in the middle of the page, right in the middle of the page. And I'm convinced, Nathan, and I want to see if you agree. This is one of the crucial lenses. She actually repeats this twice that you're supposed to read this whole chapter through. Right in the middle of the paragraph that begins a distance of only 11 days journey. We can go back to anything you want to yeah, go yeah, back yeah. to. If you jump down to the last sentence in that paragraph, it says, Jehovah had worked wonders. This is page 453, 377. Jehovah had worked wonders in bringing them from Egypt. And what blessings might they not expect now that they had formally covenanted to accept him as their sovereign and had been acknowledged as the chosen people of the Most High? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. notice the word formally covenanted. And then now I'm going to go forward uh, to page 456, 379. 
And again, we'll get to this in a second, but I'm just yeah, jumping yeah. ahead. Right in the middle of the page, furthermore, they had covenanted to accept Jehovah as their king and to obey his authority. Their murmuring was now rebellion. And she yeah, makes this yeah. great point that when they're on their way to Sinai, nobody really knows what's going on. All they know is these plagues have fallen. There's this guy with a staff at the front of the pack. He's leading. Yeah. There's this pillar of fire and of smoke that's leading them around. But they're super disorganized. They don't really know what's going on. And some murmuring breaks out. Some violent skirmishes breaks out break out as the Egyptian armies are approaching, right. but God doesn't punish That's, in, yeah. that, in this way the, at that time. Yeah, and she pity, says it's because they hadn't formally covenanted. Yeah, it's pity for their ignorance and blindness. God right. did not visit the sin with judgments. So I, I think I'm this convinced is really, that's the lens. I, I think it's that's the lens for this chapter. One of the, there's a fascinating reflection on the commandment that says, thou shalt not bear the name of the Lord your God in vain. Okay. Right? That's a and, third commandment. Right. So this is Israel entering into covenant relationship with God, yeah. and Israel bears the name of God as his covenant people. Right. And the idea yeah, Israel, is... a great point. The, uh, the idea is, is that it's actually not possible for people who aren't God's covenant people to bear God's name in vain because they actually they don't... They don't take the name. They don't take the name. That's right. Ooh. That's a great point. I mean, it's, maybe it's a little sidetracked No, here, no, 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 no. I, 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 I want to actually go a little further down that pike. I think that's a great point that you're making there. As soon as they become the nation of Israel, remember Israel was the name given to Jacob when he had that successful night of wrestling, wrestling victory with God, right? Victory with God. And now these are the descendants. Of, they're literally calling themselves. We're the people of the covenant making, covenant keeping God. Yeah. So when you enter into that, it's a little bit like before you married Becky or before I married Violetta, there were things that were allowable, mm -hmm. right? Like there were, you know, you're not married yet. You're sort of exploring. But when you get married, then things that would have been totally permissible mm -hmm. prior to the marriage are now completely off sides. Yeah. Right? And there's a strictness about it. She actually uses the word exactness in yeah. this chapter. And sometimes love, no, not sometimes, love and covenant need to be protected by order and by exactness and by intentionality. Yeah, yeah. And even sometimes by judgment. Right. And judgment features in this chapter. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I, I didn't want to I miss, think that's, an, that's an yeah, important That's lens. huge, huge stuff. I didn't want to miss uh, 452, yep. 376 in the original. Okay. There is a paragraph, God is a God of order. Yep. And then about mm, half to two thirds of the way through that paragraph, all who are working for him are to labor intelligently, not in a careless, haphazard manner. Like the hippie church. So the other day we went to this restaurant and this restaurant has the most incredible service. Okay. The, 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 the oh, servers. you and I. Yeah, talking, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. David and... You and me. So it was it was done. The, the servers communicate in such a way, yeah. with such an intentionality, that you feel so relaxed and so unhurried. It's, it's true. And they communicate in a way that makes it clear that this restaurant is absolutely committed to accommodating your every need. Right. And and you know, I, I remember reading that Apple has basically a book that they make all of their Apple employees memorize if they work in the Apple stores so that so that when customers have interactions with them, mm. those interactions end up in a positive way, even if the customer comes in unhappy. quite unhappy. Yeah. And and so I think it's so interesting that that you know, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, right? But we kind of allow ourselves to be very haphazard in our churches, mm. in in greeting and organization, and um, not that we need to adopt some sort of military, um, right. disciplined, you know, strict order in that sense. But we need to say, like, this church exists for the worship of God, and this church exists so that people can connect with God, mm. and we need to take that seriously and and consider. How are we being intentional, very intentional? Um, the word she uses, not in a careless, haphazard manner. There's that, that word. Is, work should be done with faith and exactness. Or exactness, precision. That's exactly right. Um, and so I just think that's something that yeah. I, I, I'm gonna, I wanna wear that. I wanna say, wow, in my role as a minister of the gospel, I need to take this and I need to- Silver tone be, stare. Remember silver oh, tone? Of course. Um, Love you, brother. So, so by the way, this is like the sixth time I've eaten at this restaurant. It's a great little breakfast place here in the sort of Denver metro area. And uh, every time I have gone there, I have noted 
that the service is amazing, the people are friendly, and I said to Nathan, and I've said this to people that I brought there before, you can tell they're trained. Yeah, exactly. Right, like it's not just that, look at this, every time I come, I just get the best waiters and waitresses here. No, they're trained. Oh, that totally happened by They're answer. being taught by their, like it's corporate culture. Yeah, yeah. They're saying, we're here to provide a great place, to be a blessing, and this is the way we interact. And we can, like I used to teach my elders, like literally when I was in, at Kingscliff Church, I would teach my elders how to go to people in church how to introduce yourself, how to start a conversation, and then end with prayer. Mm. Like, that's a skill. It's an actual skill. Because it, if you were to see me at the King's Cliff Church, at the end of every service, I've got my arm around two, three, four, five, six people praying, rather than saying, hey, I'll pray for that. Or, or people say, hey, could you pray for it? And I say, yeah, I'll pray for it. I find that I was often getting home and I couldn't remember. Well, what was that thing I said somebody had to pray for? So what I learned to say is instead of well, I'll pray, pray for it, now. let's pray. So the point is, is that I was trying and, you know, with some elders, it was successful and with others less successful. Mm -hmm. But you have to literally teach people. Yeah. You have to teach how. I mean, that's what we do at Arise, really. You think yeah. about it. You're just teaching people how to be disciples. Yeah. So great point. Great point. And, you know, the next little little sentence there, the, the, next, the beginning of the next paragraph, God himself directed the Israelites in all their travels. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you something I've been saying a lot lately is God's people are filled with his spirit, and they hear his voice, and they follow Jesus. And Amen. I think this is, is we need to think about our lives as Christians and think about our lives as churches in, in this very way. We are God's people, and God is directing us in our travels. Amen. And if we take that attitude, then that will be the truth. And... Um, Anyway, I just, I think there's a power in that positive affirmation. And the word that we keep coming back to here, to here again and again is intentionality. Yes. Like if you take that posture and you live with intentionality, it's going to help you to distinguish between the things that matter most and the things that are tangential yep. that you can ignore. And what ends up happening here, by the way, just for Israel is they start to concentrate on things that are tangential. You're on your way to the promised land and you're complaining about the cookies, right? right? You're complaining about the man. Wait, 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 wait. We got bigger fish to fry here, man. We're, this is... We we don't need man. It was easy. It was convenient. Right. It was apparently you know had the whole uh, you know portfolio yeah, of, like of every nutrition. Vitamin, every mineral. Everything's in these you know coriander wafer honey cookie things, and yet they're like, hey hey God, um, could we get some cucumbers and some melons? Oh yeah, remember those leeks in Egypt? Oh yeah, could we get? And God's saying, hey, what? We're we're doing a bigger thing here. Mm -hmm. You're, I'm going to bring you to a land flowing with milk and honey. I understand the whole food thing and settling down. That's not what's happening right now. Oh boy, I mean, we're doing a, an intentional thing now. We're on a journey now. Forgive me for getting thinking go about in, the, go in. thinking about the local church, but like, how often do no, we I say love that that's as a what local you church? I love that. Right, like we're thinking about the local church and we're saying, like, hey, this is our goal. Our goal is to reach people with the gospel. And then somebody's like, ah, but I don't like the music, or ah, I don't Thank like you. this, or Thank ah, you. I don't like You're that. Like, it's like, what? That okay, isn't even okay. a thing. I, I get it. Okay, so here's an idea. You don't like the music. How about this? When you're in your car, when you're in your house, when you have your earphones in, don't listen to that music. Hey, there's an idea. But now that we're all together collectively, and this is what I tell people, everybody's making compromises. Like when you go to a potluck, I mean, how often do you go to a potluck and they have exactly your ideal meal? You're like, this is exactly what I would, this is what I would order in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. No, you're there and you're like, well, I wouldn't put that much cheese on this. And this has got a little bit too much garlic and, and uh, I don't like mayonnaise, but you just eat it because you're there as a community. You're there doing something together and your personal desires and, and, uh, you know, uh, interests the things that you personally prefer are not, that's not the thing that's happening here. Yeah. That's what happens yeah. the rather other six and a half days of your life here. I don't, I don't want to be unkind to, but just yeah. kind of shut up and, and realize that there's get a on bigger mission. thing. Get on mission. Yeah. This is what I've been saying. Any, all of us can have an idea. We can't all have our way. Yes. We can all have an idea, but we can't all get our way. Not it's, in a church of, I mean, how big is the church you're pastoring? You have like seven, seven, eight hundred people. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine if, you know, seven or eight hundred people just say, hey, I want it like that. No, I want it like that. I want it like that. You can, this is what was happening in Corinth, right? And Paul's like, what mm -hmm. in the world? Not, not going to work. Get on mission. Not going to work. Right. So this is a great point. Like they're, they're on a very specific journey here. It's only, she says it's only 11 days journey. I know. It's like can 11 you imagine? days. 
11 days away from your destination. And they're and like, then, we want quail. I saw somebody said earlier, we're whaling. For, they were they were whale. They had a whale for quail, right? Like, <laughs> come on. We got bigger oh. fish to fry here. We're doing bigger stuff. And all of a sudden, the most important thing is, like in the case of, you know, uh, uh, Aaron and Miriam, oh, you know, Zipporah, she's the one. Mm. And oh, we want better food. And why are we going through the mountains anyway? We don't want to go through the mountains. Yeah. And and Moses is just like, if he had hair, he's tearing it out and saying, I, I cannot believe I said mm. to God, no, blot me out of your book and start with these knuckleheads. Yeah. Right? You know what's fascinating? I'm looking on the next page. I hope yeah. I'm not getting ahead of you, but 454. You, you You're can, a little ahead, but I'll, I'll circle back. Go. You can see that like, the journey is becoming more difficult, and as things become more difficult, correct, things I know begin to break down. Correct. And you know, it's so interesting because when when everything is great, I'm the world's nicest guy. Yeah, right. But as soon as I don't get a little sleep, or as soon as you know things aren't going my way, you didn't, you didn't my, get the breakfast you wanted. Yeah, the car begins, or you, the car breaks down, and you, you know, you've all of a sudden you've got a few little trials, and you're on edge. You begin to murmur, you begin to complain, you begin to whine. And uh, anyway, that's kind of what you begin to see here. Totally. Right? Anyway, you so just back. I just love this 453. I just thought it was really beautiful. The paragraph, yet it was almost with reluctance. I'm just going to read oh, this. Yeah, yeah. I, I wrote in the margin. What'd you write? I just, just, just did a blue line. I there. just wrote in the margin here, nostalgia. I don't know. Do you know what the word nostalgia means? I know you know what it is, of but do you know what it comes from? No. It literally comes from a longing for home. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, which is so interesting because she talks about it as home here. Look yeah, at this. Yeah. A lot of nostalgia in this. I mean, think about it. They've been there for a year. And, and one of the coolest things is, she says that before they began on their journey, did you pick this up? She says that they celebrated Passover, which, which mm. is so cool, right? Because they had their original Passover right. where they literally left later. Egypt. And then they're at the base of Sinai for basically a year. And then before they leave on their journey, they literally celebrate the first non-Egypt Passover. Like now it's not just an actual thing that's happening, an event. It's a, it's a memorial of the event. And I imagine... The nostalgia, wow. the memories. How powerful. So powerful, right? So let me just read this. Yet it was almost with reluctance that many left the place where they had so long encamped. They had come almost to regard it as their home. There's the root word mm -hmm. of nostalgia, a longing for home. Within the shelter of those granite walls, hey, we can relate, Yeah. right? I mean, this is our, this is our territory. In fact, when she says later that they started to go through the mountains and everybody was angry, I would have been like, Woohoo! Let's go over the mountain passes. You know, let's go backpacking. Let's go rock climbing. They had almost come to regard it as their home. Within the shelter of those granite walls, God had gathered his people, apart from all other nations, to repeat to them his holy law. They loved to look upon the sacred mount on whose hoary peaks, that mm. snowy peaks, and barren ridges the divine glory had so often been displayed. Come on now. The scene was so closely associated with the presence of God and holy angels that it seemed too sacred to be left thoughtlessly or even gladly. I, so, first of all, it's great writing. Yeah, yeah. And second of all, it's just beautiful. You know, this is this is this is where they met God. It's where they were married to God. It's where they fell in love. And now they're starting off on their journey. And then, of course, I'm going to move out of this because as soon as things start to get a little rough, you get a little hiccup in the you know a wrinkle in the shirt, a fly in the ointment, and the wheels come off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just the first sentence, four fifty four. Uh, 378 in the original. As, they, As advanced. they advanced, the way became more difficult. And then the next paragraph, after three days journey, open complaints were heard, <laughs> right? And then these originated with the mixed multitude, many of whom were not fully united with Israel. And I think, you know, <laughs> this is interesting because when we have God's mission at heart and we are working for the mission, mm. that's what I think it means to be fully united with, agree. The, with the church. It doesn't mean you agree about everything. No, you can't it agree about It means we agree everything. about the mission. That's right. Everybody can have an idea, but not everybody can have their way. That's right. I, I love that. And, I'm going to quote that over and over again. And when we're not fully united, then we are continually watching for some cause of censure. Right. And I think that she actually says that. She yeah, says that's watching, her language. The next language, they were looking to find fault. And then she says, dissatisfaction is contagious. One of the most important sentences in the whole chapter. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that dissatisfaction is, is contagious. Ain't that the truth? I mean, Nathan, how many years have you pastored? 20 years? I have been pastoring since 2000, December of 2000. So more than 20 years. Yeah. You would have experienced firsthand that dissatisfaction can create greater dissatisfaction. And before you know it, 
People are upset. They don't even oftentimes know why they're upset. They're upset because others are upset. Yeah, that's right. You know what's though? The opposite of that is true, right? And yes, it works in the reverse, doesn't it? Enthusiasm is contagious. Correct. Joy Thank is you. contagious. Thank you. Right? Yeah, beautiful. And we should just remind ourselves, and I mentioned this to Nathan today when we were rock climbing, the mixed multitude is not an ethnically mixed multitude. Oh, this was... Because there were Israelites that were complaining, and there were Egyptians that had made Yahweh their God. So, so in your brain, you're probably a little bit inclined or trained to think mixed multitude, that's the Egyptians that tagged along. Remember, there were the hangers-on that just sort of tagged along when everybody, mm -hmm. everybody went out of Egypt. 3,000 of them were slain in the Golden Calf incident. But the mixed multitude means it was mixed. It that's was Egyptians right. and Israelites. It's not ethnic. These are the complainers. Yep. Again, God's not doing an ethnic cleansing here. What ends up happening is some of these people get whacked, not because of their ethnicity, but because they've formally entered into a covenant, entered into a covenant with Jehovah, and now they're like breaking ranks. That's exactly they're right. They like want to go, exactly you know, right. they're married, but they want to go over here and go over here. And God says, yeah, that's not going to work. These are yeah. the incorrigibly wicked. And God sees that. God knows that. And I'm going to talk more about that in my rubric. Okay. Okay. Now she gets in after this section. She's, she kind of transitions to a whole kind of conversation about how they're clamoring for flesh to eat. Right. And they're displeased right. because they're being restricted to just manna. And um, and then she kind of goes through this thing. And I thought this was kind of an interesting thing because she... Hey, Jennifer said I made a great point about the mixed multitude being mixed. Oh, yeah. that is Jennifer, I love it when you affirm me because you're one of my favorite people. And you're also super smart and super spiritual. And we love you. Uh, she says, through temptations addressed to the appetite, he has, to a large extent, led men into sin from the time when he induced Eve to eat of the forbidden fruit. Right. It was by the same means that he led Israel to murmur against God, intemperance in eating and drinking, leading as it does to the indulgence of the lower passions, prepares, prepares the way, way That's what for I am men doing. to disregard all moral obligations. And, you know, it's, it's in my mind, it's not that, it's not that the food is the issue. Correct. It's it's the breakdown Correct. in the will. Yeah. You, yeah you, I totally agree with that. It's yeah. not like if you eat a cupcake or whatever, then all of a sudden you can't stop looking at pornography. No, it's when you do something that ah, that's probably not in my best interest. Then you do it again. Then you do it again. Then it's easier to, in a larger sphere, yeah, yeah. a more morally significant sphere, to do that same thing. Yeah. Absolutely. You basically train absolutely. the brain to not be disciplined. And this comes back to not being intentional. Like, for example, right. if you want to lose weight and you want to eat well, you have to be intentional. Well, yeah, especially in our society, right? Because you have to be because intentional. Because so much of the food is not food. Because, As Ty says, yeah. it's food-like substance. Yeah, and unintentional eating means you're like going to be snacking on chips and whatever. By the way, I learned something so powerful, or I noticed something so powerful in the book of Genesis about the original diet. And and I'll just share Bring it here it. just very it. briefly because it's so By powerful. By the way, somebody just said it's, Look, look, look at this. Somebody said, let's see, Gerald Wayne says, the excitement and joyfulness of you two guys is very contagious. <laughs> hey, that's see. what we were just saying a moment ago. Just as dissatisfaction is contagious, enthusiasm is contagious. That's exactly right. All right, so check this out. In Genesis, God gives Adam and Eve a, uh, a, a fruitarian diet. Right. He gives the animals a vegetarian diet, okay. right? And then at the fall, he gives... Um, Humankind. The uh, vegetarian, vegetarian diet, diet and animals are then given permission to eat meat. They begin to become right. meat eaters. Carnivorous. So then the earth is filled with violence. And then after the flood, humanity is given permission to eat meat. Now check out what's being said theologically. What's being said theologically is in the fall, human beings are becoming more beast-like. Whoa. That's incredible. That is incredible. And and she actually says that in this book, that yeah. they became like brute beasts. She's talking about the flood. Yeah. Right? The Leading up to the flood, like Lamech. Yeah. Right? Like yeah, yeah. They just are becoming more beastly. Yeah. So the, the, I, Whoa, that's the narrative point. through these dietary changes is just saying humans are becoming like the animals. They're becoming like the animals, and it's progressively getting worse. Okay, Robin says, say, Robin Martin... 507 says, say it again. Explain it again. Just start from okay. scratch. Pretend that you didn't say any of it. God created Adam and Eve as and, fruititarians. Right? Because there it the, says in Genesis 129 that of every herb bearing, 
By the way, that's how you know what a fruit is, right? If the seed's in it, that's a fruit. Yep. So a tomato's a fruit, a cucumber's a fruit, a mango's a fruit, seed's in it. Yep. So that's what they ate. They ate fruit. And then the animals ate the plants. They ate the, the, the what does it say? The, the herb of the, the herb field. of the field. Right. Then at the fall, the animals were given permission to eat meat. Right. And humans were, does it say that expressly or it's just intimated? It's just intimated. Intimated that there's like, you know, thorns and thistles and creation is, is going into confusion. Mm -hmm. But what it does say expressly is that human beings began to eat the herb of the field. Correct. Okay. And essentially what it's saying is that through the fall, human beings have become more beast-like. That is such a great point. And then I love your point about how after the flood, because obviously, you know, the whole earth had been decimated. Right. And it was going to take a while. That's why they had to take, you know, two of the clean and or two of the unclean and seven of the clean. They're eating those animals. That's right. They're becoming carnivorous. That's right. They're becoming more beastly. Humanity has become more Ooh. beastly. Yeah. And by the way, you have the same thing, right? Like with uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Becomes like this beast, right? Like he's this horrible person. And God is like, you know what? The, you know what? You're embracing the fall. You're becoming more beastly. Yeah. So you can be smitten with insanity and go behave like a beast. Exactly. And, and the then, Bible actually, there's several places in scripture that refer to human being like beasts. They're, yeah. they're like brute beasts. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. Anyway. Because what separates us from the animal kingdom? It's our moral compass. That's right. And that's why. Right, you, like a, a lion or whatever kills something or a hyena kills something and it doesn't say, did I really need to do that? But we do that. We reflect. Right, right. We have a moral compass. But when we lose that moral compass, even on small things, and that's the point here. Exactly. Right. The point here is, is that when you begin to alter your moral compass, even on small things, seemingly insignificant things, then all of a sudden it becomes easier to keep that compass in that same orientation, Yeah. right, when it's a bigger issue. So you're, you're right, Nathan. It's not that the food was the thing. It's that the food was just one of the ways that they were allowing their desire to, I want what I want and I want it now. Mm -hmm. Well, that that is beastly. Yeah, that's not yeah. moral. That's not intentional. That's not exercising restraint. So, in Woo! the context of Israel, kind of grumbling and going from bad to worse, yeah, she she makes this incredible uh, point. Four fifty five. God brought the Israelites from Egypt. That paragraph, three seventy eight of the original. It says, in the accomplishment of this object, He subjected them to a course of discipline, both for their own good yeah. and for the good of their posterity. I saw that. I, you know, is she talking about epigenetics here? I, I don't know, but okay. I just know that um, the dis New Testament discipline is not pleasant, right. but it is necessary. Right. Yeah, nobody's like, hey, can I have more discipline? Let's keep moving. Yep. So then these murmurings and tumults break out. This is page 456, 379. God has pity on their ignorance. He Just for the record, this person says, I'm glad cupcakes don't lead to porn. Yeah, yeah, no, they don't. And by the way, I ate a donut today because I more than earned it. I would have burned, I would have burned probably 1,500 calories a day climbing and hiking. And uh, so I got home and I had a donut and I still have muscles, so it's fine. <laughs> um, so now this is one of the made, major paragraphs or major pages here, 456, where again, it just reminds us, we've already fast forwarded here, but just to yep. remind yourself, they had covenanted to accept Jehovah as their king and to obey his authority, their murmuring was now rebellion. And you have to settle that in your mind. Again, to use the marriage illustration, there are things that were allowable for me before I married Violetta that the moment I married Violetta, those things were no longer permissible. Yeah, that's right. And so too, and that's some uh, that's a decision I made. Mm -hmm. So I don't get to then say, hey, whoa, 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 babe, but a week ago, you wouldn't have been upset about this thing that I've done. Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, we weren't married a week ago. Yeah, yeah, you remember that thing that we did? So now murmuring is not just murmuring. It's not, you literally heard the voice of Yahweh from Mount Sinai with such thunderous cacophony and you know cataclysm that you yeah, thought yeah. you were going to die. You walked through the Red Sea on the on the dry ground. Okay, you don't get to be ignorant anymore. You don't get to be a whining, whinging, complaining, fault finding pain in the neck anymore. Yeah. You forfeited that opportunity when you walked out of Egypt. If you wanted a different God, you can mm -hmm. go back to the God of the frogs, the flies, the whatever, mm -hmm. but this God's not going to, we don't roll like that. Yeah. Yeah. Moses, of course, is absolutely heartbroken by the weight of what he's bearing right. and by the rebellion of God's people. Yep. 
And and I just it says in the middle of page four fifty seven. I a knew sentence. you were going to say it. Does in it start? his distress, he okay. was tempted even to distrust God. That's right. And to me, this was such. It's, it's such poignant. A, it's very poignant because Moses is such an awesome person. He's such a good man. You can tell he's a beautiful human being. And even he was tempted to distrust God. Yeah. And because um, the I burdens were heavy on him. I mean, yeah. Moses falters here. And I'm gonna. I want to. I guess this is as good a point as any to make this point as good a time as any. These other people, they didn't falter; they rebelled. Like mm -hmm. Moses' spirit, God can look down, and He doesn't just read the actions; He reads the spirit, He reads the intent, yeah. He reads the heart, and He sees that even though Moses falters here, in fact, she says that that the appointment of the seventy to assist Moses was unnecessary. Right. It wasn't necessary. If Moses would have seen himself not as in upper management, but as in, you know, you know, administration, God's the one. God's in, you know, I had a church member. The reason I keep using that language is I had a church member in my last church in Kingscliff. He used to say, too, we, too many Christians think they're in management. No, we're in public relations. Hmm. We're not in management. God's in management. We're in public relations. Our job is to make the company look good. We're to make Jesus look good. We're to make God look good. That, but then we want to act like we're in management. We're not in management, mm -hmm. right? And what's happening here is, is that Moses starts to take on to himself uh, more than was his. And right. this is what's so cool. God doesn't write him off. He says, I get, I get it. She literally says that, that, that he, he sympathized with Moses in his burdens, even though he knew mm -hmm. that Moses' burdens were unnecessarily being borne by him. Yeah, Cast yeah. all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Now, can I say something yeah. in that same, same paragraph? Just a couple sentences before it. All their hardships, even their, imagine. their imaginary sufferings, they charged upon him. And we need to distinguish between sufferings and imaginary sufferings. Ooh. Okay, because there is real suffering in the world. And I've experienced suffering, and Nathan has experienced suffering. But some of the things that you and I might be inclined to refer to as suffering or trials or difficulties, the difficulty largely exists between the ears, not in the actual external world. And then we create something yeah. that if, if we just said, you know what? Okay, so I'm eating cookies for 11 days. Let's go. They end up eating cookies for 40 years because they don't do the thing. Like they yeah, get yeah, off yeah. mission. I'll tell you the thing that drives me the most crazy is when Christians in America talk about being persecuted. Right, I know. Oh, because somebody just, called you a Bible thumper or what? I it's just like, yeah, this is not persecution. Yeah, we wouldn't know persecution. I mean, in in the context that we're in, it's it's actually a crime for most of us to talk about being persecuted. Oh, somebody hurt your little feelings. Oh, somebody said a mean thing about. I mean, Nathan and I today were rock climbing next to these two guys. We were climbing on this cliff, and then these other guys showed up, and they were nice guys. Yeah. But while you were climbing one of the routes. They, you didn't hear this, but they were like, hail Satan, hail Satan, Satan. They were just like being weird. I mean, they don't know we're Adventist pastors. They don't know anything about us. But I mean, they were just like doing this really weird thing where they kept saying like, hail Satan. And I just thought to myself, whatever, they're just a couple of young, stupid kids. And they actually ended up being really nice. Yeah. I didn't like, oh, I can't, oh, I can't hear this. I don't want to hear that. You know, I didn't do right, that. Right. It was like, look, if you can't bear that, it's like God said to, you know, Jeremiah, look, if, if you can't run a race with the footmen, how do you think you're going to keep up with horses? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You feel me? Totally. Totally. So she has at the bottom of page 457, this whole thing about burdens, burden, burden, burden. She uses it again and again. And that Moses was taking on himself all of these burdens. And uh, then uh, God says to Moses, look, I'm going to, I'm going to give them quail. They're complaining about the manna. They're complaining. So I'm going to give them quail. And then even Moses is like, yeah, God, I don't, I don't, how are you going to do that? I mean, it's funny, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can split the sea and you can talk to me from a mountain and you can, you can do, yeah, but how are you going to, how are you going to feed all these people? It's yeah. very much like what happens with Jesus. We don't, where should we find bread that all these may eat? Yeah, yeah. It's right? Like, uh, and then, and then that? check this out, bottom of page 458. She actually says that God reproved Moses for his distrust. Mm -hmm. Has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you'll see what will happen to you or not. I got to say, as a bird watcher and as a vegetarian, I don't love this section. Okay. Because all these quails show mm -hmm. up. And uh, that's not cool, right? Like, because quail can often be very confiding birds. They're what's called a gallinaceous bird. I won't bore you with the details. But gallinaceous birds tend to be very confiding in certain circumstances. They're approachable. And I can just see these beautiful little quail. And there's just like thousands and hundreds of thousands of them. In birding, by the way, this is what we call a fallout, right? So you have a major storm or a, a major situation can create these 
funnels of migratory birds. I've literally seen this, not like this, but I've seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of birds in a migratory funnel get shoved down out of the sky in a northward uh, spring migration. Uh, this was in the south of Canada in a place called Point Pelee. And they just, it's literally like the sky is raining birds. I've seen it. And as birders, we call it a fallout because the weather patterns sort of conspire together to concentrate birds. And then all of a sudden, like, on, and they're exhausted very often. You're like, there's branches right here all around you. And these just totally exhausted birds are just sitting there. You could go right up to them, touch them. And you don't touch them because they're, they're, they're like on the verge. They're trying to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's something like that happened here, right? Like God directs these weather patterns. You have this giant fallout of all these quail. Hmm. And they're exhausted, no doubt. And then these Israelites are like, woohoo! Dinner time. Dinner time. Done with the cookies. Give us the quail. And then uh, it ends up not being good for them. Yeah, yeah. I like that. You know, one thing that I noticed and I thought was really profound, when they select the 70, uh, Ellen White says, their influence would assist in holding in check the violence of the people and quelling insurrection. Right. Yet serious evils would eventually result from their promotion. Mm -hmm. And so God responded to the need in a way that was consistent with what Moses wanted. Right. And yet it still the, wasn't ideal. It wasn't ideal. Yeah, great point. Yeah. And and we mentioned this today when we were on our way up the, the canyon there going rock climbing. And, and I want you to tell the story you did today, but let me set it up. Like I think we underestimate, she talks about how, you know, violence was breaking out and there were these murmurings and these kerfuffles and these quarrels. Again, remember the whole chapter starts off with them being very well organized and very orderly. And then all of a sudden the wheels start to come off and we don't want to walk through the mountains and we don't like this food and the whole thing's sort of coming to bits. And what happens is when you have a large group of people and there starts to be a little meltdown and then it just, it's contagious. And all yep, of yep, a sudden yep. you have chaos. And when you have pandemonium, and I think we've seen this. Maybe you've been in a situation. I saw, it, and I've already told you the story of my earthquake experience in New Zealand in 2011. It's like people are not thinking rationally when, when stuff starts happening around them and they just respond in really irrational, crazy ways. And that starts to happen here. And she says these, you know, they needed some officers and some chiefs to sort of quell it. But it was a mess. Now, you told yeah, yeah. me a story today, and I want you to tell it. it so great. in Michigan conference camp meeting, there was, uh, you know, I was running the junior years tent. Years ago. This is many years ago, more than, a, like a, more than a decade ago. I was running the junior tent, and a storm came in, and I was radioing. For those that don't understand that, it's a giant tent. Just explain it a little like, bit. Yeah, like, like a huge circus tent, right? And it's got j two giant upright pole, poles, and there's like and, and young 150 12-year-olds in the room, right, in gotcha. the tent. And, and this, you're like preaching and stuff. And terrible weather comes and and the the, the storm is building like a central Michigan and, storm. And the and the tent is shaking. And in fact, there was times when even the wind would blow so strongly that these giant tent poles would just like they're huge. lift up and drop back down. I mean, it was absolutely scary. And I was radioing in, radioing in and to the leadership saying, Hey, I think we've got some serious weather. They're like, Oh no, it's, it's gonna, gonna go around. It's gonna us. go around us. Well, the truth was that a tornado came through and wiped out a portion of the camp. So at the worst of it, I'm just like, I got to get these kids to shelter. So I said to the kids, I said, kids, you know, the storm is coming. We're going to evacuate to the storm it's shelter. Windy and it's, it can happen very quickly. And the kids, as soon as I said that, they like got up and started running. And it was like, I saw immediately that like people were going to be trampled and it was going to be bad. So I took the microphone right to my mouth and I <laughs> said, stop running now. And like every single kid just like, totally froze in whatever <laughs> position they were in. And then I said, single by line. And they're all just like, Shoo. and then they just, and then, and then I marched them to where they were going. And I was afraid that if I didn't exert absolute authority, authority. chaos, was somebody was going to get hurt. Because people freak out. When people freak out, they just, the, the rational brain goes out and they're just, it's like they're freaking out and everybody else is freaking out around. Ah! chaos. And so by exercising that authority, it just sort of arrested that. And then by commanding them precisely what to do, they all just got in line and it, and it worked out just because fine. They, we, we need that sometimes. That's right. And I kind of got that feeling as I'm yeah, reading very much through this, so. it's just like Israel is going from bad to worse. Pandemonium is breaking out right. and, and God has just got to bring some order back to Which he does. this thing. 
So no. then I just love this section. I'll just say a brief word about it where the judges are appointed, the oh, 70 yeah. are appointed. And, you know, she quotes there from Deuteronomy 1 where the judges shall not show partiality. They can't be afraid of any man's face. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, it's lovely. And then just go down to the paragraph four on 459. Again, evidence was given of the, I love this language, of the lofty, unselfish spirit of the great leader. Mm. Like Moses is a dude. Yeah. Right? Like, I don't know if you remember, you weren't with us, Nathan, but let me just remind you of how much of a dude Moses is, okay? You, you've read this book before, so you know this. Let me just read you this. Moses was fitted, this is page 295, I've read it to you like five times. Uh, 245 of the original. Moses was fitted to take preeminence among the great of the earth, to shine in the courts of its most glorious kingdom, and to sway the scepter of its power. His intellectual greatness distinguishes him above the great men of all ages. As historian, poet, philosopher, general of armies, and legislator, he stands without a peer. <laughs> hmm. Wow. I mean, like the guy was, wow. he was uniquely qualified for this role. Yeah. And God qualified him. That's the truth. I mean, God yeah. qualified him in the 40 years in the Midianite wilderness and the 40 years in Egypt, but he had to unlearn a lot of that. Yeah. Well, and, and then it's so interesting because you see the humility of Moses when the 70 elders of Israel are filled with the spirit. And then there's some jealousy. Oh, there. I love that story. Yeah. Yeah. Tell that and story. Then, and then, and then, well, there's two of them that were like, they kind of, they were did, too humble. They were yeah, like, they were like, I'm yeah, not worthy. We're no, not worthy. I'm, I'm just going to go to my tent and pray. They get filled up with the spirit as well. And then, and then, um, Joshua, Joshua hears about this. Like, Hey, there's, I counted. There's only 68. And this is some, something's irregular there. And then Moses, he says, I'm going to go sort it out. Yeah, and then Moses <laughs> says, are you zealous for my sake? I love that. Oh, that all the Lord's Ooh. people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. I mean, this is such an incredible line. It's beautiful. Because Moses is the, is the leader. He's the prophet. It would be so easy for him to be like, oh man, all these people are prophesying. It's going to reduce me. What? All these yeah. other people now are, 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 you know, voice boxes for Yahweh? Yeah, yeah. And then when the two don't show up, he's so cool about it. He's like, hey, look. You know, it's, it would be great if all 600,000 men and then all the women and the children were all prophesied. Everybody, yeah. By the way, that's one thing I've always loved about you, David, is oh. that you are a person who is always sort of giving people opportunities. Mm. That's something I've always appreciated about you. Yeah, You're, I love that. Because you have a lot of opportunities mm. and God has used you in such powerful ways and you don't hoard those. You're always like, you're bringing people onto this onto this channel to I love tell that. this. And I just, I, you've done that from the very beginning, and it's a beautiful thing that you do. Oh, you're going to make me choke up. No, I, 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 I love seeing people do well. I mean, as a mm -hmm. pastor, that's got to be one of your greatest choices. To, to, to me, when you, when you take the opportunities, the privileges, even the talents and skills that you have, and then you use them to be a blessing to others, and they do yeah. well, you're like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. And, and, and you're not like, what? Look at this guy. He's doing well. Well, now people aren't going to think I'm awesome. Who cares if people think you're awesome? Right. We want people to think God is awesome. That's right. That's right. I mean, even today when we were climbing. Look at what Jen says. He's very affiliated. Uh, that's one of Jen's favorite words. Jen, you use that word about me all the time. I, I could have yeah. prophesied that. Anyway, what were you going to say well, about like, Even climbing? today when we were climbing, right? Like those guys that were kind of a little funny. Yeah, they were, right? they were cool. They were really good. Really nice guys, actually. And then we were kind of coaching them yeah. and cheering them on. And yeah. then they were able to do their climb. That's and it right. was just like so much fun. To, to be like, hey, it's, yeah. not, it's not like, oh, Dave did the climb, and then Nate did the climb, and then, that and then we're super cool, yeah, right. and if they do it, then it's going to diminish us. Yeah, it's like, I, no. I got to tell a little bit of the story of this. It's actually kind of cool. Even if you're not a rock climber, you might enjoy this. So what happens with climbing is there's grades, and the harder the climb is, the higher the grade is. And so we went mm -hmm. to this cliff today called the Graveyard, and the, the route that we were working on has actually got a, kind of a funny name. It's called Hellbender, and it's a, quite a difficult route. Yeah. I'd been on it before. I wasn't able to do it, but I'm, I'm stronger now and I felt really good about my chances. And I did it first try. Mm -hmm. And Nathan had already done a, also a very difficult route. And I said, hey, Nathan, what do you want me to do? Do you want to try this route? And you said, yeah, I'll, I'll take a burn on it. So he did it, worked the moves. And then to everyone's astonishment, because there's this little crowd now there, Nathan did it first try right after he'd worked out the moves and he did it. And so now we have what we call in climbing a send train, right? Like the route's gone down. I did it clean. Then Nathan did it clean. And now these other two guys are there yeah. and we become their biggest cheerleaders. 
We're like, you've got this. Just remember to, you know, stick that little sloper and break. We're, we're coaching them through. And literally when they're in the middle of the moves, we're like, go, go, get that right foot up. Move. And, and, and then we left and we said, look, if the last guy, the fourth guy, because we wanted to go do another climb kind of around the corner. We said, if you get it, hoot and holler, let us know. And that's exactly what they did. And it was just so like instant camaraderie. And the camaraderie came, this is key, not from competition, but from celebrating the successes of others. That's exactly right. That's exactly Woo! right. And Moses does that, right? He's not like, oh, I'm the leader. I've got to maintain this exclusive position as the voice of God. Oh, it's me. This is very John the Baptist, right? Like, right. no, no, no. I've got to decrease and he must increase. Right. Whew. Would that all the people prophesied. Um, and, yeah, I wish I wish everybody was prophesying, Joshua. This isn't a jealousy thing. Yeah. This isn't a me thing. This is a God thing. Okay, yeah. then we've got to talk now about the Aaron and Miriam thing, which okay. I thought was quite interesting. Tell so, the story. So Moses had married a woman named Zipporah, who was a Cushite, right? That's from Egypt. Uh, right. Excuse me, Ethiopia. Yep. Right? She's a descendant of Midian. Or she's Midian. a Midianite. She's a Midianite. So, but apparently there was some like, womanly rivalry. And by the way, I've actually seen this several times in my life where you have a person and they have a really close relationship with a sibling. Like they have a very close brother or a very close sister. And then that person marries and there's this little rivalry between the new wife and the sister or the new husband and the brother. Like this rivalry breaks out and that's the sense you get here. In fact, yeah. she does. it's not even the sense. She just says that the whole idea of you know, taking Jethro's advice and sort of putting people in charge in layers, Miriam, in her envious mind, gets this idea, oh, this isn't a Jethro thing and this isn't a Moses thing. You know what this is? I, this has got the fingerprints of Zipporah all over it mm -hmm. and we weren't consulted. And, and there's this evil eye here of detecting and seeing, like we talked about earlier, they were fault finding and, what did they say? Fault finding and watching for some cause of censure. Mm. And that's exactly what Miriam's doing here. She sees something that's not there. No, this was a Moses thing. It was a Jethro thing. It was a God thing. But she intuits because, oh, hey, we weren't consulted. How come we weren't brought into this? Because you're not only the prophet of the Lord. I mean, we also have prophesied. And I led out on the singing and the dancing when we came through. And then God's like, yeah, I need to have a little conversation with Moses, or with Aaron and Miriam. Bring him to the door of the tabernacle. And they go there and she actually says, interesting, another little insight on Aaron. We've seen this again and again. Aaron knew that her complaining was unwise and unfounded. And yet he falsely sympathized. And mm. we had a whole chapter earlier. Um, we had a whole section earlier about false sympathy. I yeah, and she uses that word. 433. Yeah. Yeah, just remember that incredible section on false sympathy on page 433. 361 in the chapter on Nadab and Abihu. Mm -hmm. And this was because, and it's Aaron again. Aaron, because he was like, oh yeah, my kids. Oh, you want to build a golden calf? Okay. And then here, Miriam, and he knows in his heart, now this is unfounded. This is ridiculous. This isn't Zipporah. Mm -hmm. But what does he do? He's yielding. He's acquiescing. And so he goes along. And when God calls him in and says, hey, I want to have a little conversation with you at the door of the tabernacle. Miriam, kabam, smitten with like leprosy. leprosy which was the kiss of death in the ancient mm -hmm. world. And Aaron is like, ooh, oh yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, probably shouldn't have gone along with that. Shouldn't have encouraged it. She even says, and this is now the third time we've learned this about Aaron, that he could have put a stop to it. And she says he could have put a stop to the golden calf incident. And he could have mm -hmm. created a situation where Nadab and Abihu hadn't been judged by the Lord and taken in flame. And he could have, this is, he's such a yielding, accommodating, acquiescing person that he he kind, of, he kind of appears not to have a backbone, mm. right? And that's the false sympathy there. So there's a lot, she talks a lot here about, in fact, she says about envy. A co this person says, a cooked noodle. A cooked noodle. <laughs> now listen to this. Mm. I thought this was so interesting. Bottom of page 463, that this manifestation of the Lord's displeasure when Miriam was yeah. smitten with the- uh, I underlined exactly the, the uh, Leprosy. leprosy. You're there? Yep. Oh, read it. Was designed uh, to be a warning to all Israel to check the growing spirit of discontent and insubordination. Insubordination. Woo, she dropped that right. word. If if Miriam's envy and disaffection had dissatisfaction. not been dissatisfaction had not been signally rebuked, it would have resulted in great evil. Envy is one of the most satanic traits that can exist in the human heart. And it is one of the most baleful in its effects. Ooh. 
So this is a great illustration, again, of where God gives the rebuke in the small sort of number. This is a point that we've made earlier where, where you know, God sacrificed thousands on one occasion to save millions. Mm. And God here rebukes, signally, she says, which means seriously and markedly, markedly Miriam, precisely so that this didn't fester and become a thing. Mm. She needed to like be like, oh, that envy thing was not good. It's not. Eh. This isn't yeah. the Miriam show. This isn't the even the Moses show. This is the Jesus show. This is the yeah. Yahweh show. Check your privilege at the door and realize that God is graciously condescending to use all of us so it's not about you and stop yeah. being envious. Yeah. You know, both of us have pastored churches and in our ministries, we have labored to create gospel-focused, Jesus-centered, open-hearted churches where sinners are received with welcome and open arms, right? Like that's the kind of churches that we have tried to create yeah. by God's grace Amen. that we're trying to lead. And yet you've, in your church, had to practice church discipline. That's in true. the churches that I've pastored, we've actually practice church discipline. We're not out there. I tell people we're not the refrigerator police. I'm not the fashion police. We're not out there trying to to look for people's uh, problems, but sometimes... But there's a difference between that and insubordination, incorrigible right. fault-finding wickedness that refuses to be corrected or altered. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And sometimes it has to happen. That's true. Yeah. And I'll say this, in the in the... Two particular in instances that come to my mind in the last church I pastored. In both cases, when we exercised, you know, a, a long process of church discipline that ended uh, with uh, dismemberment, uh, where we—I don't like the word yeah. disfellowship. I well, hate it, that but word. dismember, you didn't dismember. Them. No, we didn't cut them up in pieces. <laughs> but like, they're no longer a member. Yeah, right. right. But that doesn't we, mean I they can't come to the church. The word that we use now is removal from membership. Okay, removal from <laughs> dismemberment. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> but anyway, here's the point. In both cases, the church rallied and even had a little, lots of individual revivals because people said, well, I got to check myself. Mm. I've got to, and all of a sudden people just take themselves, they take their work, they take the church, the mission more seriously because, hey, if we're going to take ourselves seriously, mm. then we have to take insubordination and, and fault finding and incorrigibility yep. seriously. Yep. And when we do that, everybody benefits. Yeah. You know, I, I love the last page. I thought it was just kind of a, a great way to bring the whole chapter together. It should not be regarded as a light thing to speak evil of others or to make ourselves judge Beautiful. of their motives or their or actions. It's it's very easy. I was to really do that. convicted by this. Yeah, me too. Me too. It's so easy to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and then she says, "Why?" She quotes the scripture because she quotes James. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. It's a fascinating thing to say. But if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but a judge. That's such a clever argument. It isn't. Yeah, unpack that for us. Well, I just think he's basically saying you are in no position to apply the law at that level of sort of moral. This is what Jesus means in the Sermon on the Mount. When he says, don't say raka and don't say thou fool mm -hmm. you're you are making a moral judgment which is different than an evaluation of behavior right this is a moral pronouncement about someone's basic standing before god we can say adultery is bad we can say murder is bad we can say that we can evaluate actions what we cannot yeah. do is take that next step and this is what i say collapse the distinction between the sin and the sinner mm -hmm. right as mm -hmm. as christians we have to stubbornly resist the temptation to collapse the distinction between the yes. sin and the sinner yes. no we can evaluate bad decisions and we know what sin is but as soon as we say that someone is identified with sin to the point that we now think we can judge them we're actually showing that what we're trying to do is stand in judge of the law which we ourselves are in violation of we're in no position to be doing so and then james makes this great point if you do that what are you a judge now yeah. No, there's there's one judge. Yeah. Right. And so I just think it's a great point, point. and it's yeah. a great place to land the chapter. Yeah. And then she she takes it a step further, right? Like there's a special responsibility for the to not do that to the leaders. Right. Right. I and mean, that's easy to do too, because like an yeah. old mentor of mine used to say, the higher up you get, the easier you are to shoot at. Yeah. Exactly. Right. You get higher and higher exactly. and higher, and you know I'll be honest, I I sometimes see people. Uh, I don't want to use names here, but I'll just say that I, there are leaders in our denomination that that they're leaders, and God has put mm -hmm. them in that position, and 
they're there. And I, it drives me crazy, even if I myself think, you know what, I would have handled that situation differently. I do not like it when I see people just taking shots on social media or being unkind to right. these people. Because I know some of these people. And even if I'm like, yeah, I think they could have handled that different. Yeah, but who are you? Who are you to be? These yeah. are men and women of God who are on their knees doing their best. And yeah, they're going to make mistakes. Yeah. Even Moses faltered. But the idea that you from your armchair could suddenly be... No, I don't think so. I I don't like that. Yeah, it, if God wanted it's you, it's too make, easy. That's if, why I don't like it. It's lazy and it's too easy. If God wanted you making those decisions, yeah, you'd be in that position. You'd be in that chair. Thank you. I mean, it's just it's, it's just lazy. that simple. It's lazy. Yeah. It's intellectually now, and morally lazy. It doesn't mean that we we can't like write a letter. Of course, it doesn't mean that yeah, we yeah, can't yeah. express ourselves. Of course, it doesn't mean that we don't have a role. In the church, in in the when organization Jeth of the by church. By way of illustration, when Jethro said, hey, Moses, I think you get too many responsibilities here, mate. How about this? Have you thought about this? Yeah, yeah. That's constructive that's input. Right. That's saying, that's right. hey, have you thought about this? That's a totally different thing than we're going to see, for example, with Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Yes. Where there's just like, Moses is getting higher, so they're trying to take these pot shots. Yeah. And I see that, and especially now with all these digital warriors, very often, by the way, hiding behind the sort of veil of anonymity, digital anonymity, mm -hmm. and they can they know everything. They know everything and, and everybody else is making mistakes, but if they were in charge, everything would be right. Yeah. Now, I tell you, it's cowardly, especially yeah. if you're doing it anonymously, but to, as you say, Nathan, to write a letter, to, to go about it through the proper channels and to express a concern. I mean, we were talking to my son just today and he was, uh, he attends a university and he was saying that one of his close friends wrote a letter to the university president and said, hey, have we considered maybe handling this situation like this? And incredibly, within a week, the university in actually made the changes. Yep. And then Landon said the university even used a lot of the language. The rhetoric, yeah. Yeah, a lot of the language that had been used in the letter. So that's totally fine. Yep. Amen. It's not only fine, it's, it's good because leaders need accountability too. Mm -hmm. But that's a different thing than just making these moral yeah. judgments. This person says, it's okay to write a letter if you sign the letter. Thank you. That's a great point. Yeah, sign the letter. <laughs> By the way, I have in my pastoral ministry received anonymous letters and every single one goes straight to the trash. I do not read anonymous letters. I don't care what they say. And here's why. If you're not gonna claim your ideas, why should I pay any attention to them? Yeah, yeah. That goes straight to file 13. I learned that from Dwight Nelson. Also, I, do, I will say this. I, I like social media if you use it correctly, but when I get sort of, you know, lambasted or trolled or called out by people that are like, you know, lollipop three, two, one, or, you know, unicorn seven fifty three. I don't pay any attention. I, 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 if it's a person, a human being that I know and has a name and they're going to interact with me, great. But I'm not interacting with people that are hiding, not, not in this way, yep, yep, yep. you know, that are, that are coming at me and they're nobody there. I can't even, there's no accountability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just such a, an artificial it's relationship. Amorphous. Yeah. It's what? It's like, they're, they're just like this yeah. amorphous. It's well, like, I'm arguing with the digital Ethereum. Yeah. I'm not going to do that. Okay, Nathan. Yeah. Rubric. All right, let's start. Okay, so we start with the word. We start with the, we point. Start with the point. With the point. What was the point of this chapter? Do you want me to tell you what I say? And sure, then I'd love okay. to hear what you say. I say, here's the point. To tell the story of a kind of progressive disorderliness overtaking Israel as they began their journey from Sinai. Yeah. Kind of yeah. starts to break down. What would you say the point? I would say it's the same, but I would work backwards. Murmuring in disaffection brings a terrible wake in its in its path. Right? Yeah. Like the yeah, murmuring, yeah. it just it goes from bad to worse and it's the murmuring. It doesn't stop. It's that's not right, just murmuring right. and then that's it. It murmuring leads to something. Exactly. Okay. Uh the person, what do we learn about God in this chapter? I put God is patient. And he read the motives and general. He reads the motive motives and general spirit of a person, such as the case with Moses, and he can tell if this is incorrigible rebellion or a mere faltering under heavy burdens. Mm, mm. And I like that. In what fact, I learned I about love it. yeah, what I learned about God is that He is meeting the needs of the people, mm. whether it is to give grace or to hold them accountable. Yeah. He's a God who meets the needs. No, that's great. Yeah. No, he's the provider. He's Jehovah Jireh. Mm -hmm. He's the one that provides. Whatever's needed, he provides it. Yes. The prayer, God help me not to weep and complain for what I don't really need 
and that which could hinder or harm me anyway. Make me content, right? Because it says twice, they cried, they, they wailed for the quail. And it's like, why are we weeping and wailing for things that, number one, we don't need? They're just a widget. They're an accoutrement yeah. of modernity. You don't need it. And then half the time, if you got the thing that you thought you wanted, it actually doesn't benefit you anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So God, just help me to be like the Apostle Paul. What does he say? He said, I've learned whatever state I'm in, therewith to be content. Amen. I know Amen. how to... I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Yes. So if I find myself in a certain state, I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm happy. Keep me from discontent. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, my prayer would be that God would help me to be an efficient organizer of the right, church. Right. Right. Like I love what I love he that said. pastoral uh, application that you bring. Yeah. Uh, it's just. Stay on mission. Exactly. We cannot organize for ourselves. service. Exactly. Stay on mission. Exactly. Major in the majors, minor in the minors. Yep. Get on mission. Stop then, complaining un, about the cookies. Under practice. What do you say, practice? I would just say practice not speaking evil. That's it. For me, it's a simple just don't do it. It's easy, it's easy to do, right? Like, Very easy. Because you feel a little elevated. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You feel a little bit elevated. But this really cool thing can happen. When you speak well of people, you're both elevated. Mm. Right? Yeah, like when yeah. I sent that root today, I was like, man, I felt so strong. Like yeah. it just went down easy. And if I had been the only one that would have sent the root, I would have thought, well, you know, I guess I am pretty strong. You know, yeah, I did yeah. that the first try. But then when you did it, it was even cooler. Yeah, yeah. It was cooler that you did it and that I had done it. And then when those other guys did it, we had this whole like, set train going. It was like, this is great. It's just... Life yeah. is so much better when you stick to the positive. I'm not even going to say what my practice was because I don't want to obfuscate what you said there. Hmm. Okay. I just, I just, it's just so good. But my last one, I had three, but my last one was don't allow my heart to become envious. Ah, yes. Um, and you can read it in my notes tomorrow and see what I wrote there. And then Nathan, what's God's promise? Here's what I wrote. God understands my situation. He knows my heart and he knows my innermost desires. He knows me completely, and yet he loves me perfectly. Mm. He knows if this is an incorrigible wickedness that needs to be punished signally, right, right. or this is a falter because I'm under heavy burdens, or maybe I, maybe I didn't get enough rest, or I you know, ate something I should have eaten, and I'm crabby, or whatever. God's like, you know, I know David's heart. And, and he made a mistake there, and I'm going to correct that. Mm. And I just love the fact, it's like my son. Sometimes my sons, I'm like, whoa, what's gotten into Jabal? What's gotten into Landon? But I know them well enough to not write them off for a hiccup or for a mistake. Mm -hmm. And God and yet, sees the trajectory of our lives. Yeah, he knows who we are. For me, my uh, uh, the promise is God himself directed the Israelites in their travels. God if himself. God himself will direct my feet. What was your word? Oh, don't tell us. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's see what our word here. is here. People are saying God is good, thankful for his mercy. Amen. Agree. And he all have words Jen for us. Is, Praising somebody, don't know what that was about. I'm a little late to the party there. What was your word? Accountability. Accountable, great Ooh. word. Order. Order it starts off that way. Let, let me know if you see your word there. Order. Discipline. Provider. Lisa Taylor. Another order. It's going to be a lot of orders. Yeah. That's Jim. Warning. Oh, that's... Jennifer says, promise. God will work with us, sometimes giving us enough rope to hang ourselves. Oh, come on now. Dissatisfied. Discontent, correction. That's my word. What? Brent Lane 144. That's my word. Discontent. Ah. To me, the whole chapter is easily summarized in that one word. Even Moses started to get a little discontent with the situation. Yeah. But God never gets discontent with us. Come on. Yeah. Now. All right. You want my word? Well, just, let, just see if you see meek. it on here. No. Have you, you haven't seen it. No. Okay. Indulgence. Meek. Covenant. Oh, that's a good one. Covenant? That's really good. Yeah, because that was like you the could use that, so that often. was the see a lot theological center of the chapter. Really. Organization intentionally. Hey, that's Ooh, good. Yeah, yeah. Joanne Hoday. Hey, welcome we love to the you. Party. Good to see welcome. you. Welcome. Dissatisfied. Your doubt, boys are beautiful. Murmuring. And so are you. <laughs> We're hangry. <laughs> <laughs> Jen says hangry. Oh, that's hilarious. You haven't seen your subordination. Murmuring. No. no, mine's not going to be in here. Insubordination. Guaranteed. Really? Yeah. yeah. No way. Have you said it tonight? No. Oh. You haven't even said your word? No. Okay, then your word is Antarctica. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's, 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 if nobody's going to guess it. It's relational drama. That's not a word. Drama. 
That's like a it's phrase, drama. like a sense, like a paragraph. No, it's drama. drama. There, there's all this okay, drama, drama, right? I'll there's all drama. this drama, right? They're they're murmuring, they're complaining, and then you got the whole Miriam and right. Aaron and the the the, the two prof uh, the two Ooh, of the seventy. Ooh. No, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. keep going, keep so going. There's all the drama. It's just it, there's just all this relational drama that leads to this sort of disasters. That's a great point. Dra There's a little drama queen stuff going on yeah. here. Yeah, look at you're being you're being thwarted. Two words, two words. <laughs> that is not Chad Stewart. Whoa, we love you, Chad Stewart. Man, so many great people on beautiful. here. Beautiful, beautiful. And even the ones we don't know are great. Man, too. you should get Chad Stewart on this with you. Chad, you want to do one of these with me? I'd love to have you send me a DM. Uh, drama. Yeah, drama is a great word. Drama queen. Ooh, cheated. Drama. David had a negative word. Yeah, yeah. So I had this thing for a while. CJ girls give me a hard time there. Because I had this thing where that was, by the way, that was my rule with DA with DA. I had a rule where you ha I, I was trying to Jeez, select a positive so word. Drama is one word. Yeah, but Jen, he said relational drama. But now that we've moved into OT with DA, that rule doesn't count for OT with DA because it's, it's okay to have negative Jeez. words in these stories. Contagious. Ooh, that's a hot one. Ooh, contagious right. is good because dissatisfaction is contagious. Mm, beautiful. You nailed it, Nathan. Yeah, I think Nathan's word is good. What was my word again? Discontent. Uh, d just Jenny wants to know if you paint your nails. J David's a guitarist. I know it looks very... It does look kind of funny. Kind of funny, but... Can you see that? Yeah. I don't paint them. I just put like a lacquer on them because... Ooh, rivalry. I just do that because uh, I have kind of thin nails and in order to play guitar, but it's good that you noticed that. Um, who spread? That's kind of like oh contagion. rivalry. That's yeah, Sylvia. I saw that. Good work. Oh yeah, because of the whole Aaron Miriam thing. Yep, yep. Smart, insecure. Ooh, that's a good one. Oh, Stefan, that's a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, envy, <laughs> chalk dust. I know you can still see. Look at that. There's like still chalk on my hands. I haven't even showered since we got back. We just ate. Ah, uh, this is it. Red. Jen, Jen says it's true that there are more cautionary tales in the Old Testament. That's right. That's why you can have negative words like discontent or drama. Even. Hey, we love you all. Thank you for tuning in. We will be live tomorrow. By the way, I'm so glad I thought of this. We're going to be one hour earlier tomorrow. Just know that. If you're on YouTube, it doesn't make much of a difference. But for the live tomorrow, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, that allows us because you know. It's gonna be great. I actually had this idea and I'm not gonna tell it to you. We might actually still do this idea I have on Sunday. So tomorrow, hope you have a great Sabbath. Nathan's preaching tomorrow. We're really, I can't wait to hear, you know what you're preaching about tomorrow? Uh, the Bible. Jesus, the love of God. <laughs> Nathan's gonna to preach tomorrow. Then we're gonna be here at six o'clock. In fact, I'm just, okay, here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm saying. I, I, I'm just making this decision right now without, we're going tomorrow to do this. I just changed my mind. We're gonna to meet tomorrow at 6.30, 6.30, but for the first half hour, we're gonna do an AMA. You know what an AMA no, is? No, I don't. It's Ask Me Anything. I just literally decided this right now. Okay. So from 6.30 to seven, we're gonna do an AMA that will not be a part of the YouTube video, I don't think. Maybe I'll change my mind on that. But we'll do a, a 30 minute AMA, Ask Us Anything, from 6.30 to seven, and then at seven o'clock, the same time normal, we as normal, we'll do chapter 34. So if okay. you wanna come on and ask us anything, you know, it'd be great if it was largely about, you know, the Old Testament, but anyway, if you wanna ask us what our favorite flavor of donut is, we can answer that too. Definitely. So tomorrow, 6.30, we'll do 30 minutes of AMA, <laughs> and then we'll do our um, fun. chapter. That, that sounds yeah. fun. No, it'll be a blast. Okay. It'll be an absolute blast. Um, did you open or did I open? You opened. Okay, close. go ahead. Father, we are so incredibly grateful for the time together with uh, each other and with all these beautiful people. May your spirit just continue to fill our lives. May you give us a restful, restful Sabbath. Mm, and thank you. may we be truly blessed uh, this day. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.